Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 263 for Monday, July 6th, 2020. <music> Greetings, folks. And welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Of course, the difference between working musicians and regular musicians, or non-working musicians these days, is <laughs> sadly a fine line. So all you have to do is consider yourself a working musician, and you are. Here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in San Jose, California, it's Paul Kent. Yep. So, I, you know, I have, um, I have gigs coming up. Um, that, that I, I, you know, we use the show as therapy, Paul. I, I, I don't need to tell you that I'm telling our listeners that I probably don't need to tell them that either. Uh, but I've got six performances of Hedwig coming up starting, uh, Friday of this week. Actually, we open on Friday night, believe it or not. And, uh, you know, I, I've mentioned before that I definitely have been experiencing re-entry anxiety and have been trying to balance that with my logic and, and all of that good stuff. Uh, logically, I feel really good about this. It's a very small cast. There's like six people in the cast, four of whom have been quarantined together at essentially at the theater since this began. So uh, I'm not worried about them. One of them is actually the chairman of a fairly large company. Um, his company's kept him under quarantine. Um, and then, uh, and then our bass player who has also been, you know, essentially quarantined and we've all gotten tested and have been reported negative in the last week. Uh, but I'll be 25 feet from the closest audience member, all of whom will be wearing masks the entire time. And they will be socially distanced from each other the way they've spaced out the theater being behind a drum set for the duration of the show. I too will be socially distanced from even my bandmates just because of the way a drum set tends to do that any, anyway. Um, but it's, it's, you know, I'm still going to be indoors with these people and indoors is the place that, you know, just freaks me out. So, um, but I'm looking forward to playing this show. I, even as quarantine kind of started, I thought, well, you know, if there were a performance of Hedwig, I would consider it mm. because just because the it's very manageable from the, you know, the cast standpoint and like the, all of the things I just mentioned, it's very, very manageable, but, but it's still this interesting thing. And I, you know, I still feel like everything, including my plans for Friday and in, frankly, including my plans for later today all comes with asterisk pandemic, which is, you know, if things aren't right, we're not going to do it and we can make our plans, but if something happens, then it's okay to say no. Yeah. Well, you know, like, but I don't know. It's a hard, it's a hard call to make, but logically it makes sense. We are, you know, seeing cases drop and drop and drop here in New Hampshire. I'm hoping that that's, not a misleading indicator. Um, mm. But, you know, the fact that they're forcing people to be in masks or mandating that people be in masks and, and all of that. Uh, well, I think what you're saying is that if the situation you're given has flipped as many switches as can be made to make it safe, Yes. Then you just make your ethical decision, right? I mean, it's yeah, well, it's yeah, like it's, yeah. there is no guarantee. No, nope, right? there's never a guarantee. Correct. And, but we are slanting the playing field as much in our favor as possible. And now <laughs> I just got to make a call yep. as to whether, you know, from what I know, I, I, uh, here, you know, California is going the other way yeah, and, uh, mostly in Southern California. Right. Okay. Okay. But, um, but, uh, the ABC, I'll call them beverage control, um, went into a town in my county and shut down outdoor dining and said, you can only do takeout again. And, Ooh. and you know, this is causing a reflexive response from a lot of people. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, damn government overreach and, you know, what are they doing? Sure. And, you know, to be fair, it doesn't make a ton of sense because the count, one county north of us is open pretty much mm. one county south of us is open pretty much so th that doesn't make a ton of sense are the cases different in those two counties they're slightly but, you know, but not dramatically yeah okay yeah, yeah well I, yeah. like i know texas 
put in this thing where they said it, they essentially mandated mask wearing f- for everyone, but it's it's decided by county. If you have less than, or if you have more than twenty cases in your county, then this rule applies. If you have less than twenty cases, it doesn't apply. So it's this sort of automatically correcting thing, right? Which I I, I we could debate the the numbers and all that, but I kind of like the idea of okay, we're issuing a statewide order, but we realize we have a very large state here, and not every place is the same. And so if your place is safe, then you're fine. Don't worry about it. You know, and here's so the way that you that define could, that. I kind of like Here's it. the deal. I guess so. Um, my thoughts to this are evolving to the point where it is clear that many people in this country have decided they're going to make their own decision. Right. Uh, and are making decisions about masks and making decisions about social gatherings. And they're just doing stuff. Far too many. And so what started is the argument that, you know, my county, you know, r- rural South Dakota um, shouldn't be bound by the same rules as New York City. Um, the problem is that we are all in this together. Um, there is a certain level of mutual respect for your fellow countrymen that comes with decent behavior. And again, I'm calling it decent behavior. People feel quite empowered that if they don't wear a mask, that that's decent behavior. I don't get it, but it is what it is. And I just think, I think we're going to go backwards. I well, a lot of places. California, California of, is going black. I was going right. to say a lot of places, more places than not are going backwards for sure. Right. And that yeah, that's part 20, of what I'm worried about. 37 states are, are showing increases. Yeah, maybe now, even right? more than that. Yeah. it. That's part yeah. of what I'm worried about with, you know, doing this, this Hedwig gig this weekend is like, are we... And, I, and I'm a, you know, I am very much a science guy, right? I'm a nerd, you know, and so th- th- there's some comfort in looking at the numbers and the trends and all that stuff. I am not an infectious disease nerd, though, so I have to trust my the nerds that are, uh, you know, like I know I know what I don't know. And I find that that's actually quite helpful in this. Uh, but but, you know, there are a lot of places looked good a month ago and reopened in aggressive ways. And then obviously, like you said, have, have sort of gone backwards. So so that's I didn't mean to o- overly open a political discussion here because it's it's not my favorite. Well, hobby. it's relevant to when we're going to get to play music again. And, and this is the thing. It so is, you're, yeah. you're making a decision in in a, a bit of a vacuum, in my opinion. You know, you're saying in my world, um we are showing some good signs. We are, um, and this particular gig is, is taking care of business in terms of doing all the right things that they can possibly do. Totally. Right? Yep. It, yes. This particular gig, but the question is, you know, the town around it, you know, how is that working? And, and does, is, is the fact that we're doing this going to encourage people to do things that are also the right things. And the reality is, you know, the, the, the using that term right things, we're not going to know for a year what was the right thing to do right now. It, right. So I, mean, I had this conversation with, with uh, a couple of my bandmates. I was yeah. invited, I was invited to hang out. Nick had a little barbecue. So it was me, Nick and Steve and Bill, our sound guy. And we got to reconnect and you know, we were just kind of talking about where are we? What do we want to do? What does this pause mean for our brand? You know, what decisions do we want to make for for the band? I will tell you my personal opinion is that it's 60, 40 possible, 60% yes, 40% no, that we will be back playing the live audiences that want to have closer proximity or people will figure out new models that they want entertainment for by next March. I think, I think we are done until next spring of any possibility. We're a big band, we're a dance band. Yeah. People congregate when they see us. I don't see any, you know, environment, you know, California shutting more stuff down now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. States no, are, I, you know, going the other way. So right yeah. here and right now, it's, it is pointed in the wrong direction in more places than not, it seems, right? Correct, correct. Yeah, we're in, we're in a weird little bubble here in New England where, it, you know, all the governors had sort of gotten together. It's not a hundred percent consistent state to state in terms of policies and all that. Uh, but you know, they, they know that, look, if we have radically different rules 
in, say, Connecticut than we do in Massachusetts or Massachusetts versus New Hampshire. I mean, I, I can be in Connecticut in, I don't know, two hours, maybe a little less. You know, I could be in Maine in 10 minutes. So like the, the, the governors were smart to coordinate with each other because yeah. because it's basically, you know, let's let's treat this as one sort of area. And again, it's not 100 percent consistent, but it's, you know, the timing of reopenings and things have been coordinated. And and it's it seems like it's working here, but that doesn't you know, it's like, well, OK, but, you know, what's Earlier, the rest of California like? was was one of the early models for success for this stuff. Mm -hmm. Like the Bay, the Bay Area shut down before the rest of the state, before the rest of the country. Right. I and, know. That's know, the scary now, part here is like I'm aware of that. And it's like, well, how is that different? How is what we're doing here different from that? And, and that's the thing. The three things that people are saying that are, you know, there's a good article on, on Vox.com today about what what's going on in California. It's three pretty simple things. We opened up too much too fast. Yep. People are behaving badly. And then frontline, you know, essential workers are usually lower economic category workers, many people in a house, lots of impossibility to social distancing sure. in their work environments and and in their home environments, those three things are the are the contributors. We can control the first, yep. right? We cannot open up so fast. Right, right. The decision about whether to control the second is now a politicized thing. Yeah. And like I was saying to you last week, I struggle with it because when I see people promoting whatever form of hybrid, you know, maybe it's a restaurant gig, maybe it's a, um, you know, I'm playing a backyard party. In my mind, this stuff, and there's never a mask, this stuff is just going to keep us from getting open again. So, you know, it's just going to push it all out. And so, the, you know, the lesson in California is we were fine. You know, we were good, right? We were yeah. a model for success. Now you had flattened the curve first. That's right. Right. Yeah. And now California is, you know, approaching 10,000 cases a day. And oh, and we'll see in two weeks whether those cases are, you know, going to, you know. What that turns into. Yeah, exactly. Into into a death rate. Yeah. yeah. So, so you know, just purely the musical aspect of this is um, we started talking about, about opening as a country. You know, the president wanted it open it open by Easter, you know, right? He was, he was saying in March, sure. a week after we started this, you know, it, that it's going to be all done. And the whole velocity of the conversation about opening. And then that gets into some people, miss their restaurants, miss their haircuts, miss their, you know, social yep. lives. And I will say that largely that decision seems to involve things like not wearing a mask and, you know, being very comfortable in close proximity to other people. And even if there is... I mean, what percentage of that is acceptable? 50, 50% 50 people behaving well, people behaving badly. I mean, that, that doesn't sound acceptable to me, right? Should be like, this thing is out there, right? I would like to get back to playing music. I would like it to be safe and not a stressful uh, engagement for anybody involved with it. The, the yep. facility owner, myself, my, you know, the patrons, we're not doing that, man. It's just, you know, any one instance of success I, th I still think it has to be taken into the context of the larger issue that's going on around. Yeah. You know? Oh yeah. And no, I, 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 I get it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, and that's why I'm really cautiously optimistic about what we're doing here because it, it is following all of those rules. You know, like I said, I, mm. I, and I've, I've had to really work to separate my emotions from logic here because I, I know my emotions are, are misinforming me so much of my life. My gut has been like a, a North star for me in, in business, in lots of things. And it's, and once I realized that, you know, I was suffering from, you know, something called anxiety, it was like, Oh, wait a minute, my gut, I'm making fear-based decisions here. Mm -hmm. Like this, these are, I cannot, so most of the time, you know, if I, if I follow my gut, I can look backwards at, at the very least I can look backwards and say, yes, that was, I, I now see why I felt that way. I d couldn't quite process it quickly enough at the time to do it logically, but the logic makes sense going backwards. And as I do that with this, I mean, there, there are 
there are many, I'm not saying that I should not have made changes to my life because of the pandemic. I, I, I like absolutely should have, but the overwhelming fear that I had been going through have am going through is not proving out by logic, right? Like mm. being completely afraid to go out anywhere. It's like, okay, well, wait a minute. You know, like I can go for a hike in the woods. That's actually okay. Like I'm not even going to encounter other people mo most of the time. And if I do, we're outside. Like I can go, I can find anywhere in the woods to be 10 feet away from somebody while they walk past me on a path, you know, like, and, and, and we're not going to be, together like it, when they walk past me that's a 10 second thing and we're 10 feet apart like logic says that's a hundred percent safe given everything we know including current knowledge of of the virus yeah. which of course evolves too and it's important to stay don't you know I, I keep saying don't get entrenched right getting entrenched in what we knew in a decision based on what we knew six weeks ago is is probably not a really good thing uh, but you know, I would find myself like, oh, I don't know if we should go for a hike in the woods. I was like, wait a minute. What, why am I feeling that way? This, there is no logic here, right? Like I, I know why I'm feeling that way, but it's illogical, you know? And it's yeah. like, okay. And so I've really had to kind of be very thoughtful and take my time with decisions, uh, which is also, which in general is sort of a, uh, not a great thing. I mean, it's usually a sign of somebody that doesn't want to make a decision. You know, if you're like, well, give me more information. It's like, well, wait a minute. What, what, what are you actually trying to say here? Most of the time, but here it's been a very intentional thing for me. Like, okay, let me gather all the information. Let me see this. Are we all going to get tested? Uh, you know, how far apart are we going to be? How far apart are we going to be from the crowd? What's the crowd going to be doing? Is the crowd on board with this? How big is the crowd going to be? You know, all of those questions like, okay, well, I can't, I can't find anything here that would put mm. me at significantly greater risk than anything else that I'm doing. It's like, okay. And, and then with that, my, you know, my family kind of convinced me they're like, you know, it, it, it emotionally, it would be good for you to go, you know, rock out and play the show. And I'm like, well, I don't disagree with that. <laughs> you, you know, like I, I, I hear what you're saying. Thank you for thinking of that. But you know, like it's, that can't be the driving reason, but it, it, it is a valid thing to think about. Um, so I, like I said, I feel okay about it. If something, if, if there is a new data point between now and, you know, when we take the stage on Friday night, I, I've made it clear to the, to the cast, but it, I didn't even need to, like everybody's sort of on board with, like I said, sure. a asterisk pandemic, it, anything could happen. And, and, you know, we, we pull the ripcord. Pretty much anybody has veto power on this. Uh, and we trust each other not to abuse that, but also not to feel peer pressure in that you can't pull that ripcord if you, if you feel you have to, you know what I mean? Right. I do know what you mean. Yeah. So. All right. Let's, let's pivot this a little bit. I yeah. Was having a good conversation at this barbecue. And it was the concept of what does today and streaming, how does that inform our musical life going forward, our brand life, our business, you know, our, you know, the running of our bands, yeah. you know, going forward, you know, you, you, you had mentioned Hamilton, which is an interesting data point, a unique data point, but an interesting data point. Um, is it uh, unique though? I mean that like, so the, my thoughts about Hamilton were, I, I saw it on Broadway, uh, about uh, three years ago, maybe. And then I, no, it would have been, yeah, yeah, 2017. Yeah, that's right. I saw it on Broadway three years ago. So after the original cast had moved, had moved past it for the most part. Um, and then uh, we watched it on Friday night here at the house. And I mm -hmm. enjoyed it so much more at home. You know, mm. that, well, like ridiculously more. I, I was able to follow the story. I was able to enjoy all of it. It was like the sound was really well done. Um, but, but I was, I was able to follow the story. It wasn't just like all of these people shouting at me from a stage. It like, I could, I could understand what was going on. I think part of that was, was the way the sound was mixed for the, you know, for the, uh, for the, the stream that they did. It was weird what they did for the stream, but I know why they, I think I know why they did it they only put vocals in the center channel of like a 5.1 or a 7.1 signal. But it, that meant that at times there were like full instruments, like strings coming from behind me in a 5.1 scenario, which was weird, but I get it. Like you want to preserve 
that one speaker, that one channel just for vocals and don't put anything else in there. And I think that worked, uh, it, you know, able to hear every word and every line. But I was also able to see people's faces, which, you know, in a Broadway theater, you don't necessarily get to see facial expressions and, and all that. So I, I was able to follow the story. But I was as I was watching it, I was like, well, what does this do for this show? Like we can zoom out. For, we can and should zoom out from it. But what does this do for this show? Like right now, everybody for seven dollars a household can go watch Hamilton in, you know, full 4K. Full, I don't know if they did Dolby Atmos or 5.1, but whatever. Like, great sound, comfortable seats, presumably. You can pause the entire production when you need to pee, right? Like, all of that. And uh, and you can watch it again. And you could watch it with subtitles if you wanted so that you could really follow the words. Like, what does that mean for that show? Does that show even have a chance of reopening when Broadway reopens next year, does it even make sense for Hamilton to reopen? I don't know that it does. Like, like how many people are going to see that and then say, oh, I definitely want to see it live, but I know that I'm not going to be that close to the stage. And I know, you know, Lin-Manuel Miranda and Christopher Jackson and David Diggs and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, aren't going to be in the cast because they aren't in the cast. Uh so I'm going to see, you know, a cast that's that's acceptable and been hired and vetted by, you know, the appropriate people put on this show that yeah. I, I like. Yeah, I mean, like, it's not going to be that you don't get to see that in on Broadway. You get to see an approximation of that from one vantage point. And I don't like I don't know what that means for 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 that show. And then, you know, zoom out. What, you know, live, I mean, live theater in general, I think comes back, but I think it it's, you know, do we also expect popular theater shows to be recorded? I mean, that was recorded really well. And I think they only used four cameras. I, I might be wrong about that. They might've had more, but it sure seemed like there were four main shots, two center shots, and then two, one kind of wide, a little bit house left and one really wide house left. Uh, so I have, I have some opinions about this. I, I don't know. For you just know. one second. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. All right. Let's just pause for a second and uh, I, I'll be back in about two minutes and then I'll give you my thoughts on this. All right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. The, the, the magic of podcasting allows us to take a break without our, our listeners having to endure anything. So go, my friend. So we were having a discussion at the barbecue yesterday about, you know, streaming as the new business model. You know, if, if I said 60, 40 next March, well, what if it's much longer than that or never, right? So, mm. you know, five years, pick a number. And so uh, Nick was saying, you know, the Grateful Dead and Fish sell a lot of streaming tickets and make a lot of money. And so, you know, you could make the argument that if you have a built-in fan base you can probably do this, especially now when there's no alternative. Right. But relative to your point about Hamilton, I yeah. and there is a there there in, in experiencing live art first person. Uh, agreed. And I do think I yeah. think if it opened up again, you know, people people would pay to go take that experience that they liked on a screen so well and want to feel the air, you know. And so, yeah, you know, you're, you're probably right about that. Yeah. We used I'm, to, you know, have I'm, I'm coming Jobs from a, keynotes. yeah, that's true. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, so, but, but here's the thing, you know, we can talk about Hamilton, you know, they made a lot of money. Sure. Um, they, you know, they picked their t point in time or maybe the point in time picked them when it was time to leverage, you know, their asset and turn it into something streaming, you know, and same thing with the, with the dead and, and uh, you know, other big name bands that have earned an audience that they can monetize in different ways. The question really is for you and me. Right. You know, I think, I think the interesting question is I've done a couple of these streaming things. You're now a part of a couple of these streaming things. Thank you very much, by the way. You're welcome. Um, Fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, in my, in my little town uh, you know, there's X amount of hardcore music fans who, you know, make the circuits every weekend going to see, you know, one of 10 of us, you know, play somewhere. And, you know, these, these people have been given programming for the past week, for the past three, four three months. months. Yeah. For the past week times 15 or 18. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yep. And then, 
So who are the ones that can actually turn streaming and really streaming just let's let's call it more of an online presence, you know, a, a Patreon, yeah. you know, a, a donation based, uh, you know, a buy my T-shirt, buy my thing, you know, become a member, you know, that type of stuff. And so the level of acuity that you have to have as as a local artist, uh, I don't think you can. The, the problem with streaming is it, it doesn't translate well to monetizing in your local audience. You know, I, I, I think that there's, like I said, let's no, call we, it Yeah, we've talked about that. Yeah, I and I agree. Like, that's, it's not the same thing. It, it And I also agree that pe- people are going to be, people already want to leave their couches and go see live art, be it theater yes. or music or anything. Yeah, and I, I realize I may have sort of conflated an incorrect in opinion with uh, with my comments about Hamilton. Uh, more that was, how does this change Broadway going forward? And does it change? I don't think it does. Do? I owned, I owned uh, a, 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 a DVD release of Les Mis, mm. you know, years ago. And I owned, you know, a, a DVD release of Beauty and the Beast. And, you know, there's a point in time by which the expense of seeing something on Broadway or getting to New York to seeing something yeah. on Broadway, yeah. right? And even if it comes to your local town, if you have, you know, a, a place where touring yeah. groups may stop. But I do think that live art is its own thing. And, and totally. as I was watching Hamilton, I was the exact opposite. I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. I can only imagine what the the electricity in the air is as you're experiencing this if you were in person. And that's it was live art. And that's less. the thing that's killing us. But it was way less for for I've me. Never heard that for that show. I, I heard it from many people this weekend. Really? Yeah, yeah. And not everyone. Some people were like, it, it was interesting. The people that had that had not seen it in the, the in the theater had exactly your reaction. Like a hundred percent of them that I talked with were all like, "Oh man, I wish, I hope, I you know, I can see it in the theater. That would be amazing." And most of the people, I don't want to say all, but most of the people that saw it in the theater and then watched it this weekend were like, right, this was so much better because I could see their faces. And there were so many things that like little nuanced things that they do in the production that you simply that simply don't read, probably mm. even from the first row, which remember is a good 20 feet from the actors anyway, you know, let alone all the way back up, you know, to the back where, where those of us that can only afford two hundred dollars a ticket. Um, and buy them eight months in advance when Ticketmaster put them on sale, y- you know, like, cause that's what we did. That's how we got them. We did not buy through a scalper. We bought, I think we bought in September for a July show. Um, and I, and it was only because I was, uh, you know, kind of, uh, I had set up systems to obsessively watch when the tickets would go on sale. And then when they did, I would go and buy and I missed the the first round that fall, but I, I got the, got in on the next one. But anyway, you know, like, it, it, those of us that saw it there, especially those of us that saw it, not from the first, you know, 10 rows or whatever, we're all like, oh yeah, yeah, no, that was, there, there was so much more to it. I'm really like, that was my, my favorite way of seeing it. But again, I, I have the ability to say that because I saw both. I, I don't have to pick and choose, <laughs> you know, I totally yeah. get where if you saw, if I saw that at, in a vacuum, I feel like, oh my gosh, I like, this is a show I want to go see. And the reality so, is so maybe you do, maybe you don't. Les, yeah. yeah I'll, I'll equate it to Les Mis. So I, I saw Les Mis live a few times first, and then we got whatever the theatrical release was. Um, and the theatrical release of a, of a, of a, of a show, not, not that they made a movie out of it. I right. think they did that as well. Right. Right. And, and I was struck with the same type of thing as like, yep, it's still beautiful to watch, but man, that feeling when there's total silence in an auditorium, and that vibe that it creates and the mo- how it moves you emotionally. Totally. That's, that's what live theater is. And, I, yeah. and I, so anyway, the point is, I get it. You know, nuance, you can't see anything, you know, from most seats. You can't see everything from most seats. Sure. And what you can do with a, with a, with a recorded version, and they can draw your attention to certain things. And those, you know, unique reactions that that one actor has become known for that you wouldn't know about. Right? Right. I, get, I right. totally get no, the they get No, they, they get to produce... 
the, the yes, word post production <laughs> means something here. Like we know what happened, so now we're going to go back in time and tell you what to look at by by exactly. showing you that. Like that, yeah, for sure, yeah. But my point to all this is like, you know, will there still be Broadway when this opens up? I think absolutely. I think it it is a live art form, and I think that there's a you know that people get a charge out of it in the yeah. same way music is, you know, like we say, always be performing. Music is live music is a art form performed music, not guys who just stare at their shoes, but people who yeah. engage an audience to feel something that is, that is an art form. Live comedy is an art form, yes. you know? So I, I, my personal opinion is that when Broadway comes back, there'll still, there will be demand because people thirst in their soul to be touched by art. And, uh, and, uh, even, even if art is improved in a different medium, well, let's just not say improved. It's just different. Right. 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 So, so what you get in exchange for a camera angle on that one expression, you give up for those dramatic pauses in an audience of 700 people where you realize 700 people are held captive in a moment to, you know, an artistic expression. No, it, so, it's true. It, you're, you're, you're absolutely right that, and maybe Hamilton is, it, it, like I said, it, you know, it, well, it is a unique show. It may not always be a unique show, but currently it is, right? I mean, it paved the way. I don't think it's mm -hmm. Lin-Manuel's best. I've seen both Hamilton and In the Heights. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and In the Heights, I personally think is a way better show overall. Mm -hmm. But I get why Hamilton got the attention that it did. I mean, and it, it's a great show. Don't get me wrong. Uh, it, you know, it's unique. It, it, it was based on rap. It's this crazy story that's actually true and like all of that stuff. Like it, 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 it checked a lot of boxes that we didn't even know could be checked on Broadway, right? Let alone would be. Um, but I, I, so Hamilton's a, a, an interesting show because it's so dense that there, I don't remember any moments of, you know, the audience realizing that the audience was captivated because it's just, it's so high density, just pouring from the stage that any moment where that stopped, I was taking a breath for myself mm. and not like realizing, Oh, we're all taking a breath together. It was like, this is man, high bandwidth stuff. You know, you talk about Steve jobs, keynotes, right? That guy, <laughs> he was a high bandwidth cat. At, at least yeah. from people that I know that worked with him say that, but and his keynotes were high bandwidth, but he knew when to stop, you know, you know, and, and, and he would pace it out and draw you in. And Hamilton did that too, but not, not to the degree, like, like I, I know those moments you're talking about in live theater. I've, I've been very fortunate to be part of them. And in fact, have one coming up on Friday night in Hedwig. There's probably a, I would say two minute long pause uh, where nothing happens on stage. And it's a really interesting thing to, I think I talked about it on the show, but it's really cool to be a part of because it's this, you know, insane moment that lasts a very long time. And then it just stops. Mm. And, and I've never seen Hedwig. Yeah, it's a weird show. I mean, d don't mm. get me wrong. Like it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's a totally bizarre story about, you know, this the transsexual, the, the, you know, telling her story about coming, leaving communist Germany and all, like, it's crazy. You know, it's, 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 it's bizarre, but you, you know, like any good show, it doesn't matter that it's bizarre. If done well, you, you begin to empathize with the characters in it. And, and mm. this happens at a moment where there's hopefully a great deal of empathy and then it just, it just stops. And it's, I, I always find it very fascinating to see how long I can stay in the moment before I'm, I start getting antsy, like, all right, when, when are we going to move on from this? You know? Mm. Um, I mean, I still sit there because I, I understand that I'm, you know, literally in the middle of the stage, <laughs> but, um, but it, I try to stay lost in it and have the, the next action pull me out. I don't have to be the one to pull us out. So I, if I do it right, I can be pulled out of it by the show, just like the audience can, which is cool. Um, so anyway, I don't know, but yes, those moments are awesome and need to happen. I, I agreed. I just don't know that. Yeah, I, I guess you're right. For people that haven't seen Hamilton, uh, certainly this production uh, that we saw on Disney Plus this weekend and now again, if you want, um, would draw people to the theater, which is good, you know, because people are. I think yeah, so. Yeah, I don't know.
Live experiences matter. You know, they are part of our human experience. And so yeah. I would like to have one to tell you the truth. <laughs> I'm kind of, yeah. I'm kind of, I get weird, but I'm, I'm becoming more pessimistic. As I said, that uh, the opportunity will happen sooner than later. I've spent a lot of time doing videos and, you know, I should tell everybody, um, I took part in a streaming festival on July 4th. So a guy from my band organized it and asked me if I would contribute a set of music. And I, I didn't know where I would be. So I pre-recorded a bunch of songs. I didn't even go to the effort of trying to make it look like I was performing. I sure. literally pre-recorded seven songs in different dress and, you know, times a day. It didn't look like a cohesive set. It was seven videos basically that I shared which I thought was fine because of the streaming format. I don't really know relatively what value it truly being live would have. Um, so to me, I made it. And anyway, the point is, one of them, um, I got my friend Dave Hamilton play drums on, and he just did a killer job. And <laughs> people have really liked the video. And so if you're you did Facebook, a good job dude, with that video, man, I, I liked thank it. You. Yeah, well, it's just fun to watch, right? And that's yeah. the, like that's the key. It is a performance. So that's the key. Yeah. Yep. I mean, you know. It, there's still so much for us to learn about what it is like to be on the other side of that screen when a piece of art is coming to you. I mean, people have understood filmmaking for a while and that, that, that art evolves all the time and people iterate on it and innovate with it. And, you know, that's interesting. But for us that are really, you know, especially for us that are like the weekend warrior guys, we're stuck with being able to play. And some of us translate, you know, some of us can do a solo acoustic thing and it translate well. Some of these band things, like, you know, I, I love the stuff that we're seeing from the big deal bands. Like, you know, I think um, Crowded House has been the best, right? Yeah. Uh, the, those the are band, beautiful The videos. band had had the best one up until Crowded House. And then and then they they moved it up one notch. So the band, the band, Robbie. The Robbie Robertson thing when wow. they did the weight, right? I thought that was really Oh, good. the weight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And That's then, right. um, you know, the Stones contributed to this. And yeah. you, know, you all get to kind of see... Yeah. You know that this is just people kind of grabbing their instruments and playing to a large degree, and well, and the MacWorld All Star Band did it, and that was exactly. freaking amazing. <laughs> yeah. So, but you know, doing something amazing, I'm really glad that you like mine. But it, you know, you're seeing video with uh, three squares or four squares of the guys each playing their instruments, and then maybe a a feature of one guy for a while if he's singing a solo line or something like sure. that. I mean, that that we have seen now a thousand times. Yep. I don't know if you saw, I did um, a project with my friend Jeff Cohen. He's up in Seattle. Yeah. And we did, did you see that video that, that I did? The, yeah. um, the Traveling Wilbury song? Yeah. Yeah, man. So added a little video effect to it and tried to tell a little bit of a story through it. And, you know, I'm not a filmmaker, but I... I get that just simply throwing me and three other musicians faces on screen constantly is going to get less interesting over time. And so finding some ways with these amazing tools that we have that are really, you know, they're in our hands if it's the camera and you can do it with iMovie. You can do better with, with final cut or with premiere, yep. but you can do it with iMovie and you can tell a very interesting story to people. And maybe that's the, the point that I'm trying to make to everybody who's trying to figure out how to communicate your art to people who, who know you and love you or would really love to discover you just think about what the story is. Are you good with just a, one camera on you? Um, you know, are you emoting something that will stay with people? Yes. You will get a certain kickback from people. Just the fact that they can see you when they haven't had a chance to see you for a while, sure. that will be meaningful at one level to people. But if you really want to push, you know, and get your art, you know, learn, think about, when you see what other people do that's cool, can you take notes for yourself as to how to apply it to your situation, your band or your solo or your duo or trio performances? You know, how do you tell an interesting, beautiful story with your music in a time when you can't, you can't, uh, you can't do that thing where you connect with people in a live environment that that's been taken away from you temporarily. So what is the most meaningful way to communicate with them, um, you know, through a stream? And that's right. just something that everybody's learning. You know, the, there there was the first the first month of of uh, shelter in place was novelty, right? Just getting anything to people, and everybody was really everybody was happy about it. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And then people with some chops started getting involved, and the stuff started looking better, and you know, yeah. sounding better, and all that type of stuff. And now, you know, people get it. You know, you can add a transition in a video pretty easily. You can, you know, make sure that the sound is pretty cool. You don't have to just have the microphone on your phone. I mean, and all these things. And uh, uh, my bass player who was at the barbecue with me, he was like, you know, production matters. And, and 
it does. I mean, I, oh, yeah. I think that, that, uh, no, I, like I said, I think, did you do that, that video of dancing in the dark that we did together or the song that we did together where you did the video? Um, did you do that in final cut? Is that how you did? Yes. Is that what you use? Okay. So, cause I thought that like, I, I really was impressed with that. Um, oh, that's nice. Yeah. I mean, look, I could nitpick it six ways from Sunday, but that's the kind of jackass I am, right? Like I, I see things. <laughs> yeah, focus on the impressed part. <laughs> well, no, that's exactly right. But you know, like the, the one thing I'll point out, and I noticed this in the Macworld All-Star Band video and a lot of other videos is that sync is hard. When you've got an audio track that isn't just recorded and unadulterated from the camera that recorded the, the, the video track, like, you know, you, you take the audio like you did and mix it separately, even though it was recorded at the same time as the video yeah. and then the video mixed separately and then trying to like line them up together is really hard. And as a drummer, I have yet to see a video of me. I've seen videos of others where this is done, but I've yet to see a video of me where the snare drum sound happens when it actually happens. M most people that don't play percussive instruments are probably going to like, even as a, even as someone who does play a percussive instrument, like I can easily overlook it, but I can see it's like, Oh, there's a, there's like a couple of frames off in either direction that that snare drum is not that the sound I'm hearing is not happening. The moment that that snare drum is being hit. And, and it, it's because sync is really hard and I don't know how to solve for that. Uh, I would love to find a filmmaker that can, you know, say like, aha, oh, you see. I mean, I know the the general rule is th that's why you have a transient, a, a, a loud like clap sound or something. That's why they use those film clappers is so that you can see it happen in the film. But also the camera microphone picks up that that clap and you line the camera microphone's audio up, even though you're not going to use it in your film. You line that up with the same transient in the produced audio and then you mute the camera audio, but at least that way you can kind of line up that clap sound and, right. and get close. Right. Like that's the, that's the idea behind that thing. But even with that, it's really hard. Like my, and, and then things drift. There's always drift and there's even drift. If you and I were recording this podcast and you were recording in logic on your side, and I was recording myself in logic on my side, by the end of an hour, we would be out of sync with each other. And there's no logical reason for that to have happened because we're both running computers that are time synced and et cetera, et cetera. But it would happen and it's a pain in the neck, which is why it we is. do, which is why we don't do that. So one last thing while we're on the tech side of this, um, you mentioned iMovie and uh, Final Cut Pro. There is a free app. Well, it can be free if you want it to be free called DaVinci Resolve from the folks at black magic design. It is a pro level film editing app. And this is from folks that make pro level film editing apps. Mm -hmm. They make DaVinci resolve studio that adds some other things like multi-user collaboration and some 3d tools and some HDR stuff. But the, the free version of DaVinci resolve is killer uh, and, and full truly full featured. So if you don't have final cut, and you don't, you know, and, and you're, you know, you're like us where you're just sort of hacking your way through this. This isn't something that you're necessarily going to turn into a career, although it wouldn't surprise me to see some musicians who start doing this and realize they have a knack for it and, you know, kind of open that, that, that side mm -hmm. of their creativity up. But if it's not your intention, go get DaVinci Resolve. Um, and I, I've done some very light editing in it, but it's pretty easy to use and, and yet has all those same features as, as all the rest. So I'll put a link yeah. in the, in the thing. Yeah, good yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's good. So I don't know. It's crazy though, man. It's, uh, but I like that video. That was, it was, you know, it's fun. It's just like a bunch of guys playing a tune. Yeah. That's it. But, but you, you know, you sang it. And so you like more, even more than the rest of us, you performed it, which was, which was great. You gave people a focal point You gave people something to look at while they're what, while they're listening to this song that we recorded, which is, it is, it the, is a visual medium. It is the job of a lead singer, whether it's on film or in person to, uh, to capture and maintain the attention of the crowd or it's the job of the band, but more often than not, it falls onto the job of the singer. So uh, it, agreed. Yep. Yep. Um, you said you're missing performing and I, and I, I don't want to, you know, ignore the first 16 minutes of the show where we talked about, you know, all the, the repercussions of opening too quickly, but 
w- would you, and I know you're missing performing with your band and that's a whole different thing, but would you imagine a world where you will be able to play a solo acoustic gig at some point, you know, this fall maybe, or something like that? I don't think so, man. I, it's, yeah. um, um, I've been given a couple offers and I've said sure. no to, and there's one place that I've played that is um, just using their place as a street. So there's no one in the room yep. to play just, just there. It's a, it's a coffee house and, you know, just, I think their staff yeah. who's running stuff to people who are outside, outside dining. That is the most interesting thing to me because the number of people around is so low. But again, I keep going back to that thing, man. If you want to be part of the problem or part of the solution. And sure. so I just think, I just think it's a big freaking ball of confusion. If we all just shut it down for three months, if we, if we had done that to begin with, sure, and not considered the economy and just said, for the health of the whole freaking country, 132,000 people in this country dead, if we had just shut it down, how much better along would we be now? I don't know the answer to this. Do you? No, I, well, that's the thing is there's no way to know what right would be. And we have no control group, right? So we can't say... We can't even look at the last three months and say, all right, we are certain that if we had done it this way, it would be better. We could say there would be, you know, less death there potentially. Right. I mean, you know, limit exposure stands to reason that that, that there would be less death. Right. Um, But like we don't know that that would be better because I mean, there are consequences of people not interacting with people. There are also now consequences of people interacting with people. Right. Yeah. So I don't know what that balance is. I, and I, I don't, I, I don't uh, envy our, I never envy our leaders really. It's not a job I want. Um, but, uh, but I certainly don't envy them now. Any of them, the local leaders, the you know, state leaders, well, there's, the there's national no blueprint leaders. for this, right? Correct. <laughs> right. It's the first pandemic. We're all going to get something, some part of this wrong, and we won't know what part that was until it doesn't matter anymore. But at least be freaking smart about about assuming where people's heads are for this. I mean, it, it, the the politicization, politiz, politiz, help me, politicization. That's it. Of you know, like a governor shuts down his economy. I don't know why people think that that is good for a governor to do that. Like how that's going to help him if their state's economy goes to hell. But is he making a decision? based upon the, you know, his desire to protect his, the citizens of the state. Sure. Look at that well. I mean, the, the, that that we assign politics to all these things is just as nervous. And actually, just not to go down that path, for me, it seems hellaciously stressful. If I was to play somewhere right now, even a place that was decently safe. Oh, yeah. X amount of, X amount of people are asking themselves, is this safe while they're sitting trying to listen to me? I'm sitting, certainly going through my mind. Um, X amount of people are sitting there going, yeah, he's, he's giving the man the finger. He's out here performing X amount of people are like, you know, why, why are you doing this? Right. It, I didn't get the is, why when we did that gig at the end of the football field, I, I didn't get any of the, you know, let's stick it to the man and do this vibe. We certainly, yeah. and we, we certainly did not communicate that because none of the three of us feel that way. Uh, but did you understand, but you understand what I'm saying is that, that a performance right now by definition, comes with a whole bunch of perception. And I, all of that I, perception is, is uh, for me, um, I'm not sure where my head is in order to like have an intimate acoustic evening yeah. and just be like, hey, let's leave all the pandemic stuff out. You can't leave all oh, the no, pandemic stuff Oh, no, you can't. No, no. no. In fact, our, I mean, our show was, was very much like, you know, hashtag pandemic. You, you don't come close to the stage. And there were some, that, you know, you mentioned it's got to be stressful. Those were the moments that were stressful when there were people that, and I knew that there would be people there that that took this less seriously than me. I, you know, I think they're getting it wrong, but I, again, I don't know, but I, you know, playing the safe card, I did not want other people anywhere near the stage. And there were some people that got near the stage and yeah. I mean, we talked about it and it was just like, no, and, and, or I walked away and, and just stayed away from them and, yeah. and it worked out okay. But, um, 
but you know, we gave those people a football field. It's like, here, go like out there is yours up yeah, here yeah, yeah. is ours. And, and so from that stand, I can't pretend to, I do it, but I, I can't put any value on what my interpretation of other people, uh, what other people are thinking is right. I mean, I, I'd certainly do it. I, I would assume at some level we all do, but I, mm -hmm. I can't put any value on that. And it's just like, okay, are we setting up something that I would be comfortable having my family attend because in, in all likelihood, my family's going to attend. Right. But mm -hmm. so it's, it's a very, it's easy for me to envision that because it, it like, and it's going to happen. And if I that's feel a really good metric, by the way, right. Like that filter is, is like, that's the real thing. Yeah. Are you doing something that you would feel comfortable having your family be there? That That's it for me because like the Hedwig thing, I, it, the same filter, I know my family's going to come see this. I'm not nearly as worried about my scenario, you know, sequestered certainly in the, in the spotlight, but, but safely in the spotlight on stage, I'm more concerned about, you know, what are y'all in the crowd going to be up to and how safe yeah. is that going to be? And if I feel like my family would be unsafe there, then I'm just going to, I have an easy way to make sure that my family doesn't come. And that's that there is no drummer for this show. Mm. Uh, you know, and, and, and again, I, 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 you know, that sounds like a threat when I say it that way. And, and, and I haven't said it that way, uh, to any of my, you know, castmates or the, the, you know, the, the director or anything, but, but that is the, that is sort of the thought process is let, we're all going to do this safe. Everybody wants to do it safe. The theater knows that they will not be able to stay open if they don't do it safely. Um, you know, that part's been made extremely clear here in, in the seacoast of New Hampshire. So, uh, so they, you know, they are financially strange as it may seem, they are financially incentivized to not overfill that theater, right. And do it really, really safely. They also have a liquor license. So that's another thing, you know, these places that have, that are used to it, restaurants are one of them that are used to serving food or liquor are used to having, regulatory agencies defining what they can, how they can run their businesses. And, and you, you cross those lines and they shut you down. It's just very, very quick. So those are the places that I actually feel pretty good about the, the football field. I had a lot more questions than I did about the theater relative to the scenario. Now the theater's indoors. So I had different logistical questions there than I did about sure. the football field, but the football field is just like, it's the football field that the town uses. It's owned by this one guy, but he has a deal with the town where he probably pays less in taxes or, you know, whatever it is, but it, you know, it's just like, there's nobody policing that. And so it was, you know, I, I had a, a lot of conversations about that and, and it, and it was, you know, all from the, the vantage point of, am I going to be safe on stage and are my family going to have the opportunity to be safe out there? I can't, decide whether everyone is going to choose to make themselves safe. But for those that do, AKA my family, are they able to maintain the level of safety that they want to have? So that we're saying the same thing coming yeah. from different perspectives. Yeah. The, the micro decision to me mm -hmm. is, is you, you stated perfectly. Am I safe? Are my bandmates safe? Are the, are the people coming to see us safe? Would I put my family there? That thing, that's all really good. But the macro level is, is it safe out there in general? And, you know, is the right strategy for us as a country, as a county, a town, a country, you know, yeah, however wide you want to sure. go with this, should we call a spade a spade and say it's not safe there yet? We, you know, we are, we are making a mistake by getting out there and mingling amongst each other because the, that kid who went to spring break in Florida, you know, then went and, you know, walked down the street past a cancer survivor, went and saw grandma and, you know, or uh, some other asymptomatic, you know, person. Sure. And, and, you know, and they then went to Durham. Right. And, you know, the interconnectedness of things. So the that's the part that I like, that's where I had to draw my own line because th what you're describing to me sounds like the thoughts that were going through my head as I was sort of letting the fear like paralyze me. And it was, you know, I am, I don't have all that information. I can't possibly know that information. Yeah. And I'm not the infectious disease expert and I can't spend my days gathering all that information and learning how to be that. And so it was, well, okay. Well, let me, let me reframe it for you. Yeah. Try this on. 
Is three months, is four months enough times to, to, to get a, a reasonable strategy to deal with something that's killed 2 million people worldwide? Well, so again, I like, these are the questions that are not mine to answer. I, it, it, my, the whole thing that I, that I had to do to be able to, to like function in this is to say, okay, I need to go and look at the, the, the bell curve of scientific advice, right? Because there are people out there that are experts at this. And thankfully, some of them at least are paid to, to be studying this right now. And so you know, I am normally someone, I love conspiracy theories. You know, I've always said I emotionally support them. I, I don't intellectually support all of them, but I emotionally support, I cheer on every one of them. Um, on this one, I'm not looking for the fringes. I'm looking for the middle of the bell curve of scientific advice, right? And if the science is saying, do this, and and many of them are saying do this, including the, you know, the big ones, which to me are like Mayo and Johns Hopkins and the who and the CDC, uh, then that's, that's like, I have to take that as good enough for me. Mm. And, and so that's, that's sort of where I draw my own line in, like, it's not up to me to make macro decisions. It's up to me to make micro decisions based with the knowledge of not putting my head in the sand, but with the knowledge of, Here's what the macro decisions and advice are. And like I said, I, I think our, our governors here in, in New England, they haven't made any moves that seem crazy to me. Uh, they've all made moves that make a lot of sense when you kind of, when I look at it that way, I don't want to say anybody else, but when I look at it that way, yeah. So, so yeah, that, that's how I'm making those decisions. And, and if the governor were to say, you know, today, uh, we got to go backwards. You know, we, like this isn't working. We have data that, that says we've got to lock back down. That it's locked back down. Like, okay, got it. Mm. it you know, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. I, I it, respect you. I respect your thought process on it. You know, obviously I have a slightly askew to yours. Like, we agree on much, but you know, it just feels to me like we are in such a disagreement in this country about how to listen to medical advice. Totally. You know, about what constitutes uh, mutually beneficial behavior, uh, you know, what the line of personal liberty is. We are just so divided on all this type of stuff. And the net net is 37 states are, are going in the wrong direction. Going in the wrong direction. So. Oh, yeah. No, I, the divisiveness, you know, partisan politics, I, I quite frankly find ugly and I pay very little attention to it because it's just it, it, no one is right. It, you know, it's it's always this. I'm going to preach from my choir to my choir. And it it just I find it ugly. And that's about the furthest you're ever going to hear me go in public about my own political opinions. In fact, that's probably further than I've ever gone before. Um, and so I, I, I am naturally, uh, I have a natural aversion to paying attention to any of that. That's bad when that's where the information is. So I had to figure out a different way to actually get information without it being put through too many filters such that I was just going to be, you know, ignoring it. Like, oh, I can't deal with it. Like, that's ridiculous what you people are up to. So I, that's why I kind of picked this path. It was like, okay, let's just look at the scientists. I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not interested in how, how the, the left and the right and the middle and the blue and the red and all of that interpret what the left, what the scientists are saying. I just want to hear what the scientists are saying. And then I'll, I'll make my own decisions from there. I like, I can, I can consider myself an expert at listening and, understanding what people are trying to say to me. And certainly if there was, you know, of the four organizations I mentioned, if one of them was completely opposite that I would find that suspect. I'd be like, Hmm, that's interesting, but that's not happening. Like my, my, my sniff test of conspiracy theories does not yield anything for me. Right. That's right. So I am okay saying, yeah, I'm going to go with that. doesn't mean that I'm right it doesn't even mean that they're right. You know, it just means that this is the choice I've made and I've explained why. And I, and you know, I know this thought process cause I had to go through it in order to free myself from the cyclical sort of paralyzation that I was, that I was having with all this. So, uh, you know, 
I, 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 yeah. I, and I don't mean to, to imply that everyone that, that has different feelings is suffering from any kind of anxiety or anything like that, but, but it is worth asking yourself, like, where is this coming from? And am I, am I making the right choices? Are these my choices to make? I guess is really the thing because I had to ask myself that, like I was really comfortable when we were quarantined. And then when it, you know, things started opening up, I had to ask myself, well, what's, what is it going to take to convince me that this is over? You know, last week in the show, David Shanahan in New Zealand, he made a really interesting comment. He said, you know, we can touch each other again. And he, and I thought that was a great way of summing all that up that, that you know, they are almost pretty, pretty much done with this right in New Zealand. But he also said, and I can't, I think he said this in the show, but he might've said it afterwards as we were sort of chit chatting. He said, you know, it took a, a couple of weeks for us to be comfortable with the fact that we were able to touch each other again. It's like, yeah, like we all need to ask that question. What before we're there, what will make me comfortable with being, you know, going into someone's house, not interrogating each other about where we've been and shaking hands or whatever. Maybe shaking hands is a thing of the past. I don't know. But, you know, sitting down and having a meal together across a table that's not six feet wide. Right. Like, what would it take for me to be comfortable going into someone's house and having that meal? And what does the world have to look like? Because it's never going to be over. Right. And it's not even over in New Zealand. So the question that I, that was the question I asked myself was and we're not there yet, to be fair. Like, I, I, I we are not at that point. But I had to start looking at that and I reserve the right to change what the you know, what that line looks like for myself. But I had to draw that line before we were at that line because I had gotten way too comfortable being just, you know, Mr. Quarantine. And I'm taking it way slower than than most people I know. I know you are. You, you know what I mean? Like I'm I've definitely frustrated my family with this um, at times because it's like, OK, yeah, this is a good spot. Let's wait two weeks. Let's see what happens. And then, and then we can do this, you know, and everybody's like, okay, you know, and, and, and it, it, that's worked out. Okay. But it's, yep. but that, you know, it's a, it's a, but we each have to kind of answer that question for ourselves is really what it comes down to. It I'm, is true. I'm thankful. I don't have I, to I'm answer it for other people other than, you know, the four of us in our, our house, but you know, yeah. and that's a mutual thing. I mean, it, you know, I've frustrated people because, most often in our house, I am the, the, the least confident one in terms of moving forward. You know what I mean? So it's mm -hmm. it like, well, but you but have, if, you have, you have responsibility for those other people. <laughs> I, I, I feel that. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, if, if it was say my son who was the least comfortable, we would go at his pace. Right. I mean, it like, it's, it's just sort of how we decided to do things is we won't do anything unless everyone is comfortable doing it. And we all understand kind of the responsibility that, that comes with that power. So I don't know. This show went a little weird, but you know. Yeah. I mean, again, I'm sure there's people out there who like politics, get off the politics. Where's the gig information? We tried to weave in the musician's perspective of the, of the world that we're in here. And you did get a little bit more Dave and I today. And so thanks for bearing with us. It's, um, I'm sure it's a discussion you're having with your bandmates and with your family and, you know, yeah. should you take a gig? Should you not take a gig? So hopefully the the dots will connect and you, you'll find some value in this. Like we have always told you that this podcast is it, it you are listening into a conversation that Dave and I would have had by phone, just the two of us anyway, for the past five years, right? Yeah. But so, more than that, this has been going on for 10 years. We've just been recording and releasing it that's for right. five. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So anyway, hope, hope you found something of value in this type of stuff. You know, we'll get, we'll get back to tech and songs and well, next and, week uh, I can tell you about my gigs, assuming they have. Oh yeah. Yeah. Good. So, you know, that, that Good. hopefully, hopefully will be a positive show. Yeah. Yeah. I look forward to it. All right. Thanks so much for listening, folks. Let us know what you think. Let us ask us questions. Ask us questions about music, and we'll we'll get we'll throw in some gear stuff next week too. I promise. Feedback promise. at giggabpodcast.com. Here's a good way to keep our minds. Up. What's that, Paul? Always be performing. That's it. Yeah.